My name is Rose Jansen. I'm with the Academy of Science St. Louis, and we are very pleased to partner with the St. Louis Zoo to bring you tonight's conservation conversation. Uh, we're also pleased to partner with the zoo on the long-running and popular science seminar series covering current topics in science. Those are held here as well in the Living World Auditorium on Wednesday evenings. There are brochures outside at the visitor's desk, so if you haven't already, feel free to pick one up before you leave tonight. Um, many of you are Academy members and friends. For those of you who are not familiar with us, I'd like to take just a few moments to tell you a bit about who we are, and then I'll let Jim Jordan, Zoo Education Curator, introduce tonight's speaker. The Academy is a local nonprofit. We've been serving the St. Louis community since 1856 with a long-standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. And we continue to celebrate more than 150 years of community service by offering a broad range of free and low-cost public science programming, collaborative seminar series, and trips and tours that highlight science at venues throughout the region. You can find more information on us and our community-wide events and programs by visiting the website at academyofsciencestl.org or pick up some of the literature just outside the auditorium on your way out. And if you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy and St. Louis Zoo public lectures and events, there will be e-news sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience tonight. Um, if you've already signed one of these on a previous talk, don't, you don't need to, no need to duplicate that. Um, we also have uh, stickers available that we can initial uh, for students, any students who need to verify their attendance, and those will be available outside the auditorium after tonight's lecture. So with that said, I will introduce Jim Jordan, who is going to tell us about tonight's speaker. Good evening. Before I introduce our speaker and the program for tonight, let me just mention our next program, which is part of the science seminar, Making Embryonic Stem Cells Without Using Embryos, is Wednesday, December 2nd. So that's shortly after Thanksgiving. And then in 2010, we'll have two other programs as part of the Conservation Conversation series. The first one, Race for Survival, Cheetahs in Peril, by Steve Bircher, Curator of Carnivores, will be January 26. And then one of our most appealing animals here at the zoo, the American Burying Beetle, will be featured in February by <laughs> Bob Mertz, our curator, I mean, zoological manager of invertebrates. So many people noticed that we have a guest up on stage that will be making her rounds a little bit later. Uh, it was nice to be able to invite Jackie Fallon from the Wild Canid Research and Survival Center here tonight. Now, how is she here with the Peregrine Falcon, may I ask? Well, uh, Jackie was the leader for a Yellowstone trip that we offered last year. And then talking with Jackie, she mentioned her role with the Peregrine Falcons. And it just seemed to fit our programs. We like to bring in not only zoo conservation, but other conservation in the region. So I'm glad to have Jackie here. And she earned her BA in biology and animal behavior from Cornell College. I asked her, I said, so Cornell University in New York? And she said, no, the original one in Iowa. <laughs> After college, she learned of the Peregrine Recovery Program at the Raptor Center at University of Minnesota. Bud Tordoff offered an invitation to observe falcons in St. Paul, Minnesota, and watch the process of banding the chicks. She continued to assist Bud every year afterwards, and in 2005, assumed responsibility for Minnesota and North Dakota nesting sites. In 2008, she left Minnesota after 21 years at the Minnesota Zoo, working in all areas, but carnivores was one of her favorites. Um, she came here in 
to St. Louis area as part of the staff of the Wild Canid Research and Conservation Center. But she still continues her work with the Peregrine Falcons and does travel back to Minnesota. She currently also is the education advisor to the Mexican Wolf SSP as part of her duties at the uh, Wild Canid Survival Center. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jackie Fallon. Thank you very much. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Great. Um, now, I've often been asked what the attraction is and how I got involved with both wolves and peregrines. And I like conflict. Um, I like conflict management. And believe it or not, it's very easy to see that um, relationship with wolves. But we're actually coming to the point now where we're dealing that, with that more and more with peregrine falcons as well. Um, but peregrines are definitely a big passion of mine. So what we're going to do tonight is just do a, a fairly um, general program about peregrine falcons natural history and the whole recovery program. And then I am going to save the best for last. And I'll introduce the live bird I brought with me. Um, and you'll get an opportunity at the end if you want to come up and take a look at her closer. That's not a problem at all. So tonight's program is called Peregrine Recovery, Celebrating Success, but Continuing the Work. Um, basically, with peregrine falcons, to give you a little bit of background, their scientific name it can be broken down to, to kind of give you a pretty good description of what the bird is. Falco, meaning sickle-shaped, definitely the shape of their wings, which you can see in the bottom picture, and then peregrinus, meaning wandering. They are a, an extensively wandering migratory uh, bird of prey, anywhere from the Arctic Circle down to the tip of South America for some of their um, uh, travels that they'll do in the winter time. Common names, you might hear them called duck hawk, especially in a lot of the older literature. Bullet hawk, due to their speed. Ledge hawk, due to where they like to live. And wandering hawk, again, because of their migratory patterns. There are 19 different subspecies of peregrines found throughout the world. We've got three here in North America. Um, and they're all slightly uh, different, but it's very easy to just take a look at one and say, that's a peregrine, it's not a hawk kind of a, uh, situation, sorry. Um, their physical characteristics, there are some differences between the adults and juveniles. There's not a color difference between the sexes, but the upper right picture is a pair of young, newly fledged peregrine falcons up on the North Shore. They're a beautiful buffy brown with a lot of streaking color to them. Um, the other two birds are adults, the beautiful slate gray and a very classic um, cap look to them. Uh, the sexes, the males, are smaller. They're often in a lot of the literature, you'll hear the word tiercel, which means one third. And basically, a male peregrine is about one third smaller than what a female may be. Their shape, they definitely have that long, angular look to them, which helps them with their speed if they're going into a dive or a stoop. And they have some very unique adaptations that really fit into today's uh, changing landscape that we have here uh, throughout the world. Pre-DDT, uh, there were some birds that were known to nest in trees, not many, um, but Kansas has a few records and a few records in Europe and um, other countries like that. But there were not many birds nesting on man-made structures. We didn't really have skyscrapers until the mid-50s and 60s. And so we actually created a type of habitat that the birds have taken advantage of and do really well in today's urban society. Primarily, peregrines like water. Um, they like cliffs, and that's primarily where you could find them. So if you look at parts of the United States along the two coastlines or along the Mississippi River, the Great Lakes area, you would find a fairly decent peregrine population pre-DDT. Now post-DDT and with the recovery program, again, because we've changed the landscape so much, we've got development going on in some of those cliff and natural areas. Um, and we've created these wonderful 50, 60, 70 story skyscrapers that the birds seem to adapt to, especially like here in St. Louis, right along the river, and certainly up in the Twin Cities metro area, and basically from southern Minnesota down through Iowa into Missouri, the birds 
really enjoy um, areas like that. Chicago, they really like, again, because of the skyscrapers. We've also created things like smokestacks. Um, the Labadee Power Plant, nuclear power plants throughout the Midwest have been a wonderful um, recent participation to the Peregrine Falcon Recovery Program. Again, they provide height, they're generally fairly near water, and there's tons of food available for them. Uh, lastly, birds do nest on bridges, but they generally are not very successful when they nest on bridge, bridges. If that bird takes its first flight at about 40 days of age and doesn't have some place close to land and doesn't really know how to control that speed and that power, they usually end up in the water. Sometimes they can row to shore, but more often than not, um, we end up with a, quite a few drownings with newly fledged peregrines off of bridges. But we still do have birds continue to nest successfully or change their nesting uh, site and go someplace better. Behavior, peregrines are known for their speed. Um, they have a straight line speed of 45, 50 miles an hour, um, like many other birds, but it's their stoop. Uh, to go into that bullet, pull the wings back and look like a teardrop when they fall through the sky chasing their quarry. Uh, they've been clocked at over 200 miles an hour with absolutely no problem at all. A lot of times they will rake their prey. Um, all birds of prey have a special back toe called the halex. It's the most powerful toe for a bird of prey and they will often hit um, whatever it is they're going to go after with that back toe, swing back around and grab their prey. Falcons also, when you look at the live bird or even in some of the photos up there, you'll see they have a notch in their beak. That notch is a great adaptation to be able to break the neck of their prey fairly quickly after they bind to it or after they catch their quarry. Um, rather, if you're a bird flying in the middle of a city with something as large as yourself, you're going to want to gain control of your prey fairly quickly or you might end up smacking into the side of a building pretty quickly. So by having that unique tooth or that notch, that's going to definitely be an advantage to you. Um, one little bit of interesting fact I found a few years ago is that basically a pair of parents that have four chicks in their clutch for the six birds total during that nesting season, they will eat or kill nearly 500 pounds of food. Now they're not always going to be able to eat all of that, but especially when those chicks are fairly young, they're eating two, three times their body weight just to maintain growth. Um, by the time the birds are about six weeks of age, they're taking their first flight. So those first couple of weeks are real crucial to that growth. So those adults are doing an awful lot of hunting, primarily pigeons. They're extremely social. That was my first um, excuse me, they're extremely social but they're very defensive in their behavior as well. And my first experience with peregrines back in St. Paul was getting whacked on the head, having my hard hat go flying off the top of the building and then having the bird come back and scrape me across my scalp. Um, I, I, as far as the birds were concerned, I was just a giant non-flighted great horned owl that they were trying to protect their babies from. We continue to see that, especially in urban areas where the birds have experience with humans. By diving at us, they um, can chase us away. They get rewarded for that, and every year it sometimes goes up a notch. They're also extremely territorial and defensive against each other, and we're at the point in many locations, especially up in Minnesota and Wisconsin, where the population is a little higher than it is here in St. Louis, that the birds will kill each other to gain possession of a territory. Um, generally, the tallest building, the pr premier nesting site, we're seeing one or two mortalities a year um, throughout the Midwest. And again, it's just so many birds in a limited space fighting for whatever resources are available. Causes of decline. A lot of times, people will blame falconry, number one, for the decline of peregrine falcons, poaching, of the birds or egg collecting. And although um, all three of those categories did take birds out of the wild, they didn't have the high impact that DDT and the, the characteristic of DDT, DDE, that caused the thin, thinning of the eggshells that caused this species great um, demise. In the beginning, uh, pre-DDT, we had about 40 pairs here in the Midwest. 
Our recovery goal was to have 20 um, nesting territories for the 13 state area. Um, nationwide in the lower 48, we had about 700 nesting pairs um, in the 40s. DDT took its effect, it became real popular, very effective control measure for insects on crops. It not only affected peregrines, but it also, um, we've learned, affected bald eagles and offspray as well. Surveys were done in the Midwest by falconers, and we found out by 1964 there was not a single known peregrine falcon nesting or even located east of the Mississippi River. Um, where we once had about 350 nesting pairs, not 30 years before that. We had a big conference in Wisconsin in 1965 that was started not only by the folks here in North America, but also by people in Britain, in Germany, in France, um, throughout Europe that were also seeing the same decline. And basically we had about an 80 to 90 percent decline in the peregrine population worldwide in about 30 years. So obviously something had to be done. And therefore, you know, captive breeding and recovery to the rescue. Um, in 1970, at the time of listing, we had 39 known nesting sites in the lower 48 states. 39. Um, a couple here and there, um, certainly none east of the Mississippi River. So we started a recovery plan because feds and the state, we like bureaucracy, we've got to write everything down, we've got to go through this big long process, decide what our goals are, or our objectives, what's a minimum number, what are we going to consider recovery, um, and kind of go from there. So in the late 60s and early 70s, falconers basically came to the rescue. And this is something that's not often um, known for this program, and it's certainly something that's not even common for other species recovery programs. I can't even think of another repro recovery program really out there that was started by hunters, essentially. Falconers had some of the few peregrine falcons left. They used the birds for hunting. They graciously donated their birds initially to the peregrine fund here in the lower 48, that was started at Cornell University, the other Cornell, and it just blossomed. Uh, the Peregrine Fund was formed and they started initially releasing birds in the mid-70s. Um, now for us in the lower 48 we have the subspecies Anatum. Remember I told you we have three subspecies of peregrines found in North America. The Anatum subspecies was known as the Continental or basically the lower 48 subspecies. But again, we had basically eradicated them. And so we did choose to use other subspecies of peregrines for the Eastern Falcon Recovery Program. And basically Tom Cade, who started the Peregrine Fund, said, you know, you use what you got, and some is better than none. And so that's the decision we made. We did have a few anatom subspecies to use, but we also used some tundras, birds from the Arctic. We used some pelei, birds from the northwest coast. We used some uh, birds from South America and a few from Europe, but not many. We tried to minimize going too far out of the spectrum and minimizing the number of different subspecies and just trying to uh, get a step ahead of the game and get birds out on the ground. And again, like I said, it basically this program from beginning to end has been due to falconers and, and their concern for the species. So in 1963, we had our last nesting in Minnesota, which is um, the last nesting I've come across. And if anybody out there um, has any other information of that, I'd be more than happy to hear that. But basically from 65 on, we didn't have peregrines east of the river. So in 1976, for us in the Midwest, we paired up with the Peregrine Fund. Peregrine Fund had been doing releases on the East Coast, um, New York area, Pennsylvania, a few other spots. They joined forces with us. They brought some birds to uh, Wisconsin, Nelson, Wisconsin. We, we released four chicks in 76. Two of those chicks were killed right off the bat by great horned owls. Um, so we recaptured those two remaining birds sent them back to the Peregrine Fund. The Peregrine Fund came back in 77. We tried it again. And again, we had some significant losses due to great horned owls. Great horned owls and peregrines are like oil and water. They really do not get along very well in an ecosystem. 
Peregrines will kill great horns on occasion, but more often than not, great horned owls kill peregrine falcons. And so the peregrine fund at the time was thinking, well, why am I spending $1,500 to basically feed a great horned owl? So until you guys in the Midwest can deal with your great horned owl problem, we're not going to supply you with any more birds. And so the Midwest project basically shut down for about five years until uh, Dr. Pat Reddig and Bud Tordoff at the U up in Minnesota found alternative breeders. Um, we worked very closely with Walt Crawford from World Bird. We worked with a breeder out of Canada. Um, we worked with some other local breeders up in Minnesota and South Dakota to try and gather enough additional peregrines to release for us specifically in the Midwest. We gave it another shot in 82. We released birds on the other side of the river uh, at a place called Weaver Dunes. Real tall towers near the water and we did do some great horn owl control. Now I know that can be hard for people to hear, but it wasn't like we were killing hundreds or thousands of great horned owls. In order to get a species recovered, sometimes you have to manage another species that might have such a dramatic impact on the species you're trying to recover. So we did deter a lot of great horns, we used sirens, we um, did haze them. Um, and did some limited removal. And once peregrines were able to make it on their own that first year, that first year was real critical for them to learn how to be protective and um, survive against great horned owls. And that's something that only they can learn on their own. It's not something we could teach them from being captive releases. And within a couple of years, the peregrines were starting to come back along the river that we actually had to stop releases because the adult birds were being extremely defensive and territorial against these really naive, young, juvenile birds. So we moved our effort into the city. 1985, we started our releases in downtown Minneapolis, which was the first um, Midwest release for us in the lower 48. And in 1987, which is why it's in bold, we had our first successful wild hatch and fledge of a peregrine falcon in the Midwest. And that was a, I was still in college at the time. I wish I had been there that year to see that chick. I've seen pictures of her, but that was a huge, huge start. Wild born is always best, um, rather than continual captive releases. Um, Mother Nature teaches them the best, certainly much better than we can as humans, even though we think we know everything out there. And so having that first chick survive, she in turn survived long enough, went up to Canada and produced young of her own for four or five years, which was a starting point for us. We continued, we had more and more states uh, join board with us in Minnesota. Wisconsin came on board, Illinois and Chicago started releasing, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, um, Missouri, Iowa, and Nebraska and Canada. Little by little, all started releasing. We leased just under 1,400 birds. 1991 was another keystone um, year for us in that we had our first wild-born peregrine falcon become a parent himself. He was a Minnesota bird, fledged off a building in downtown St. Paul, two years later ended up about 15 miles west of St. Paul and is to this date the most productive peregrine falcon that we know of in the Midwest. He sired over a 47 young in his 18 years. So he, he obviously had a big part to do with peregrine recovery. He was quite um, reproductively successful. Um, another big date for us was delisting in 1999. August 20th, I'll never forget it. It was one of the best parties I've ever been to. I thought college had parties. And maybe it's just I'm getting older and I like balconers and biologists. But the Peregrine Fund had a celebration to announce the delisting. And it's not often that a species is listed as endangered that you can actually be recovered and get them off the endangered species list. And peregrine falcons were one of the first to accomplish that. So we basically had a three-day party. Over 2,000 people showed up from all over the lower 48 as well as Europe that had in some way had a part in peregrine recovery. Whether it was a breeder, whether it was somebody who monitored the chicks shortly after release, whether it was somebody who produced thousands, tens of thousands of quail for all these baby peregrines um, to eat. 
as well as the falconers themselves. And it was a blast. And just a little number, because everybody likes numbers and factoids and things like that. I thought it was quite ironic that for $3.2 million for us in the Midwest, we recovered a species from zero to seven, several hundred nesting pair. One fighter plane, the cheapest of fighter planes out there, cost $28 million. So to me, that kind of puts it all in perspective that with a little tenacity, a lot of passion, a little bit of luck, you can become successful with species recovery if you've just got everything all in a row. Today, we've got anywhere from two to 3,000 peregrines throughout North America. There is also, because the numbers are high enough by biology terms, we're seriously allowing take of peregrine falcons for the sport of falconry again. Just like what had been a big part of the sport's history um, for hundreds of years throughout the world, there are some states that per, uh, falconers are able to take a peregrine out of the wild like they do with red-tailed hawks or cooper's hawks or other species of birds of prey that they use for the sport. Um, we've just finished our third of five monitoring periods for the peregrine falcon. Any species that comes off the endangered species list is monitored for at least five years, if not longer. With peregrines, because of the population dynamics, the biology of the species, the feds wanted to be extra cautious. So we went to one monitoring period every three years for five different monitoring periods. Since the species was delisted in 99, we're continuing to see an increase in the population of anywhere from 8 to 12 percent throughout the Midwest. So obviously, even with everything going on, conflict with humans, contaminants, um, just life in general, harvest by falconers, a few, um, the population is continuing to do really, really well. Um, however, there is still a problem out in California with contaminants. And that's something I don't know whether we're ever going to get away from just because of where the birds migrate to, whether it's something that's just in the environment in California because of the heavy use of pesticides. Um, the California population has not rebound to the level that other populations have. But it's something we're still watching, again, through this monitoring period. Some things never change, and this is basically um, six months of my life from February through July. Um, I begin my field season in February where I do river surveys initially and kind of look throughout um, different urban areas where I know peregrines have nested, get the IDs of any known adults on territory, find out if it's the same bird as the year before, find out if the bird's ever left. Um, that's a little bit harder for me down here in Missouri now, but I have folks still back in Minnesota that do a lot of that work for me. Um, most importantly, I have to get the permits in order to do the banding itself. And depending on what state you're in, in Minnesota, we have seven nesting sites that nest in state parks. So it's not only a federal permit and a state permit, it's also a permit from the state park division. And then several of our state parks are scientific research areas that I need a fourth additional permit for. So my permitting, I'm starting to get my permits ready for 2010 right now in hopes that I have them in six months. That's my goal. Um, identify as many birds as I can. Um, I've got over 50 sites I monitor. And again, since I've been down south, I obviously am not able to spend as much time in the field, but I've got a great group of folks back at Minnesota that do a lot of it for me but also several of the sites now have webcams, so I can sit at my desk out at the wolf sanctuary, go online, yep, they're nesting, yep, the first egg. Now I can count days and know exactly when I'm gonna ban the young. So there's some sites that are, are definitely cush jobs for that. Determine the nesting success. If, if they are a pair on territory, are they on eggs? If they're on eggs, did the eggs hatch? If the eggs hatched, when am I going to gather my banding team together, try and get access to those chicks? Um, we have a very small window that we like to ban the chicks. And I'll show you a video clip in a little bit of us banding some birds at a historic site along the Mississippi River. But we like to band them anywhere from 16 to 25 days. If they're much younger than that, they can be difficult to accurately sex 
because the bands come in two different sizes. We don't want to put too small of a band on the wrong sex bird. If they get much older than 25 days, especially at some of the cliff sites, we can cause them to become what we call jumpers. We're coming over the top. They see us. They're like, oh my God, what is that creature from above? It's going to eat me alive. I'm bailing out of town. And they can jump out of that cliff. Um, and they'll do that closer to 30 days. But again, if it's a 700 foot drop, I'm not willing to take much of a chance. And so we tend to err on the side of caution. Tons of paperwork, tons and tons of paperwork. More paperwork than I ever thought was possible for, for a couple of months of my life. And then also a big key to any species recovery is raising awareness within the community. Doing active education, which is why I have the live peregrine. Get them excited about peregrines. Um, give them fact instead of a lot of misinformation. And just give them, if nothing else, just a little bit of a respect for the natural environment. You don't have to love peregrines like I do. I just don't want you out there shooting them kind of a deal if they eat your pigeons. On banding day, we do two, a couple of things. Um, we take a blood sample from um, a wing vein. We take a very small amount of blood, only two tenths of a cc, and we store that in a DNA bank that we have at the University of Minnesota. And we've got over 5,000 blood samples collected in nearly 30 years of recovery. Um, we can test for contaminants. We can determine parentage of some of these birds out there. We know exactly who um, nearly 85% of all birds in the wild in the Midwest are, which is phenomenal for any kind of recovered species. We also collect unhatched eggs. We look at eggshell thickness. We look for contaminant study. Um, that's all part of the monitoring program, and it's just good biology. And we, lastly, we'll occasionally take a very small clipping of a feather to also look at contaminant um, residue in the bird itself. It doesn't hurt the chick at all. For banding, we use two different colored bands. And I brought some bands with me. I can show you later. We always use a Fish and Wildlife Service band. That band goes on the right leg. And depending on what the color of the band is, will tell you whether the bird was born in the wild or hatched in the wild, or whether it was captive bred and released. And then secondly, we put a two-color um, alphanumeric band on. Um, letters and numbers, they can be tipped on their side in a variety of different color sequences. That band always goes on the left leg. Um, as a field observer, you are never going to be able to read the nine numbers off the Fish and Wildlife Band through a spotting scope, but I can read a project band or the double colored band from up to 700 feet away through a spotting scope. And that band is unique, and then I'll know exactly where that bird came from, how long he's been on territory, find out, again, a lot of really valuable natural history and recovery information for the birds. Um, and again, for this project or for any species really out there, we're extremely lucky in that we have about 85% of all our known peregrines in the Midwest are marked. Now I'm going to hopefully, whoops, ah, sorry, I hit the wrong button, I got nervous. Show you a video clip of us banding peregrines on um, the Mississippi River. This was done at a place called Maiden Rock. It is a huge rock face. It's about 700 feet tall. It's over a mile and a half long. And it was one of those, if you know anything about peregrines, and ever, historically, if you're a falconer and you thought about where peregrines live, this is the type of cliff they would live on. It is just such a beautiful cliff. 1999 was the first year we had birds nesting on the river which was a huge improvement for us. These chicks are um, just under three weeks or closer to about two and a half weeks of age. Not very happy about us. And there is audio, but it was taking a little bit of time to key up before too. He's just screaming bloody murder, not real happy about what we're trying to do to him. This is Matt Solensky. He was a field assistant for the Raptor Center helping me do the banding one year. We always usually have two people do the banding and, and blood collection 
although it is certainly possible for a single person to put a band on a chick's leg. Again, she's not very happy. By the time they're this age, we can accurately tell whether the bird is male or female. There's the sound. And the size of the leg really is not going to get much larger. <laughs> Pretty ugly, very prehistoric looking. It's amazing they turn from that to that in a couple of weeks. So, We're very cautious about making sure all our records are accurate, so we'll double read a band back and forth between the person putting the band on, the person doing the recording. At this stage also, you really don't have to worry about their feet. They just kind of sit there. They generally don't bite. In another week and a half, you're going to get grabbed by the feet and you certainly are going to get bit. At this particular banding, um, we had about 40 people watching us band these three chicks. It was quite an event um, for the local community, for Fish and Wildlife Service. And then I'll be taking a blood sample here. And generally, it takes us a couple of minutes to process each individual chick. The blue colored feather areas of their wing have a lot of blood in them at this time, so we have to be very cautious with it because we don't want to break or bend one of those blood feathers because it can often take quite a bit of time to get the bleeding to stop. But I'm just taking blood right inside the vein of their, their wing. Generally, in about 15 minutes, we can process all four chicks. Hey, Randy, not bad for a blood stick. <laughs> and then we put this into a blood um, buffer solution for the DNA work that basically will help um, preserve all that information for down in the, um, down in the future. Um, especially for this population where we're really trying to figure out the genetics and looking at is one of the subspecies that we used 20 years ago more successful than another subspecies? Um, does the genetic component of the species, subspecies we use have any bearing with their natural history? If they were very migratory species, are they still migratory now even though they're kind of in an area where they wouldn't necessarily need to migrate because of prey or, or anything like that. Oops. Ah, shoot. Sorry. I obviously hit a wrong button. Um, but 2008, everybody always likes to know numbers. We had 244 nesting pairs in the Midwest. 191 of those pairs uh, bred and laid eggs. Uh, we had nearly 450 chicks produced out of that nearly 200 nesting pair, um, or right around three young per nesting site. Average clutch is four eggs. Occasionally we will have five. Even more occasionally or rare would be six. We have had a site here and there with up to six live young produced. But that's an extremely large brood of kids that adult pair have to feed and take care of. Um, by today's standards, uh, we typically have nearly half of all the sites in the Midwest are on buildings. A third of them are on cliffs. Um, very few are on bridges. And then a few, about a fifth of them are on smokestacks. These are different, um, different processes of uh, looking at the birds throughout the years. Basically, this just shows you all the different states in the Midwest and gives you an idea for where the population is at. Minnesota has about a fifth 
of the 13 states and two Canadian provinces that um, we consider the Midwest population. Wisconsin's right behind us. Um, Ontario, obviously with all the cliffs and undisturbed habitat, their population numbers are really good. Um, not a lot of birds in South Dakota. Again, fairly flat, not a lot of water, not a lot of tall skyscrapers. Releases were attempted in South Dakota. The birds just came to Minnesota or went up to North Dakota. Um, they hightailed it out of town. Missouri facts for those of you that obviously you're, you're interested in your own state birds. Um, World Bird Sanctuary has led the program and recovery for peregrine falcons here in Missouri. Um, the first captive releases or hacking began in 1985 with captive produced birds out at the sanctuary. First chick was produced in 1991, which was the first wild production in 100 years in Missouri, which is again something to be very, very excited about. In 2009, we have nine sites total throughout the state, two in Kansas City, a couple outside of St. Louis area, and then this year we had 13 young produced in four sites. Um, the Interco Building, Wash U Medical School, AT&T, and then the Labadee is still technically considered part of St. Louis, I think just because the World Bird Sanctuary people do Labadee Power Station. Um, the AT&T building had five chicks produced this year, which was a very, very exceptional number, and all five successfully fledged off the building this year. So Missouri is doing well. Obviously, I've actually, to be honest, never even seen a bird here in Missouri, never had the opportunity to tag along with the world bird folks. All my experience comes from Minnesota or North Dakota. Um, and in Minnesota, we had a very good year. We had over 115 birds produced out of 50 some sites. Um, I banded 69 chicks at 22 sites, basically in a two and a half week time period. Um, my life is not my own the first couple of weeks in June because of traveling anywhere from the North Shore of Lake Superior down to the metro area, down to the southernmost part of uh, southeastern Minnesota. And then we did have about 10 to 12 birds that we were not able to band, primarily because access was restricted. Um, Today's society of Sioux happy people and everybody's worried about liability and we have several sites that won't allow us to be on their property because of potential risk. Somebody falls off a catwalk or someone gets struck by a peregrine and they're worried we're going to sue them or something like that and it's just their company policy. So we just don't have the ability to gain access to a couple of sites. But all in all, again, we're still banding nearly 85 to 90% of all the birds in the Midwest. We had seven sites nesting in the state parks, which for me is always really exciting because it's nice to see a species um, be successful in still natural areas, not necessarily in a nest box or something. They're just kind of making do with what Mother Nature has given them. And all told, we have 18 nesting sites on the U.S. side of Lake Superior. Um, even with all the development going on, and that's something we're really looking at now, is we're finding birds within a quarter mile of one another on Lake Superior. And at Lake Superior this past year, we had over a foot of snow still in April. And those birds are able to find enough food to produce three and four chicks out of that clutch every summer which is some pretty tough doing if you're a bird out there. Some interesting stories, when Jim had asked me to do this, he kind of wanted me to maybe tie in some of my most memorable times. Um, the first bird up there in the upper left, that's Soda. Um, he was named for Minnesota. Sometimes people aren't all that creative with their names. Um, the thing is, he was a captive bred bird that was um, released down at Rochester, um, Minnesota, off the Mayo Building. He was perfectly normal. He had four digits on each foot. Um, when he ended up showing up as a breeding bird in downtown St. Paul three years later, he only had two digits on each foot. Um, and we're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what happened to him? Was it an electrocution? Was it frostbite? We're really not sure. Was it a genetic deformity, um, some type of disease, some type of other injury? Um, we're just never probably going to ever know because we've never grabbed him to do any further testing. 
But our biggest concern was he was paired with a very productive female in a very popular part of St. Paul, the first nesting site in downtown St. Paul where the birds chose. And we're like, oh gosh, he's only got two, two toes with talons to hold on to food and these other little stubs kind of thing. How's he ever going to provide enough food for himself, for his mate while she's incubating those eggs for over 30 days, and those young for the first couple of days while the female is brooding those young. The male is the primary food provider for peregrine falcons, nestlings, and the female for about four to six weeks. Female, she, she's bigger, she keeps those chicks warm, she keeps the eggs warm. And by God, he can do it. Um, he's now 15 years old. He pulled off another four chicks this year. And every fall, um, spring and fall, we clean out the box. And so before the breeding season gets started in February, we want to make sure that there's not a lot of debris in the gravel and things like that and just check out if it's camera glass is dirty or make sure the camera's up and running. Nest box was perfect, just gravel. Um, by the end of July, when he fledged those young, we went back, he had um, over five inches of downy feathers and prey remains from things that he and his mate had killed since pretty much the first part of May when those chicks hatched. Because even when we checked the eggs and checked the chicks the first part of May, there were just a few feathers lying in that box. And it took two plastic Walmart bags to take out all the prey remains. We found over 50 different species of bird were identified in that box. One which included um, some poor bird banders, 18 year old um, black capped chickadee, I believe, it held the longevity record. And I had to call this poor bird bander and say, well, sorry, he's toast. He was just eaten by the pair of peregrines in downtown St. Paul. Um, but he at 15 is going strong. Um, and he is just an amazing bird to watch and obviously can provide enough food for his family. The next picture up there is a, another clutch of five we had off um, of one of the other metro birds in downtown Minneapolis. This pair of, um, or this clutch of chicks was produced off a female named Mendota. She is nasty, to be the nicest word to say about her. Um, it will take five of us to go up and retrieve the chicks. Four people to protect me with, um, we call them flying saucers up in Minnesota, the little plastic sleds you slide down hills on. They completely shield me because she can dive in and strike at the last moment before veering off and not collide with the building. Um, she can come out of nowhere and draw more blood than any other bird we have up in Minnesota. And she's big. She's about 1,400 grams. She is, I don't even think she's pure peregrine by that size. We did grab her this year. We got lucky just because her aggressiveness and territorialness were so intense. Um, one of the people that was with me, he's an experienced falconer. He went out, she came at him, he got her before she got him, and we actually weighed her. And with a crop, she weighed 1,400 grams, but she didn't have a full blown out crop um, that you would expect to weigh that much. She was just massive bird. She is going to draw more blood on more people down the road. She's also 12 years old, and this is her third clutch of five chicks for the last three years. And all five chicks for the last three years have all fledged successfully and survived into November of their fall, which is pretty dramatic. One of these chicks, the second from the left, you can see is about a th half the size of the other four chicks. When we went for banding day, he actually had a lot of gravel in his crop. Um, probably was getting out competed by his siblings and not able to get enough to eat, so was eating gravel out of the tray. So we brought him to the Raptor Center just to make sure we could flush that gravel out. And then we returned him two days later. Um, and if he was going to live, he was going to live. If he was not going to live, he was not going to live. He fledged successfully. Um, and we did not help mom and dad out at all. Uh, again, sometimes you just have to let Mother Nature do what Mother Nature is going to be able to do. Two timing younger, uh, the bird in the middle there, 
He actually, it's the first confirmed case of successful bigamy in peregrine falcons. He nests, um, his primary nesting site has always been on the 54th floor in downtown Minneapolis. Beautiful building, um, kind of rules the city right by the river. He had an unbanded female he was paired with. And then there's another female nest site less than half a block away, basically right across the street. Um, the nest box is on the opposite side of the building than what the first site was. I watched him leave the first nest site, come down, service the female at the second nest site, watch her lay eggs throughout the entire season, have him go back and forth between the two sites, and just expected, well, the second site is not going to be as successful. He's going to have enough of a job just to keep female number one happy um, and all those kids alive. And so I kind of just chucked it up and kind of didn't really pay that much attention to the second site. And I went one day and all of a sudden I saw four heads out of the second site. And we confirmed it with DNA because we had blood off of all four adults that he um, produced eight chicks in one season from two separate nests, four chicks at each site. He was one busy, busy little boy. <laughs> and He's a nine-year-old bird, which is, is getting up there in years for being a wild, wild bird. So I, I figure he deserves an extra pat on the back. Um, then there was Comet, two-time in Comet also. She um, nested on the Wards building in downtown St. Paul, and she had one mate named Beaner for several years. But then Beaner decided he was going to go to St. Paul for a while and try and take over a St. Paul site. Well, while he was in St. Paul, another male came over from a bridge site, bridge site and started getting friendly with Common at the uh, Montgomery Wards Tower. Well, Beaner got beat up in St. Paul, came back to the Wards Tower, and when we grabbed the blood from those four chicks that Comet produced in June, we found out both males had produced two chicks in that clutch. And again, we could confirm that with DNA. And that was actually a, a PhD study done by a geneticist at the University of Minnesota. And again, without all the observers out there, we never would have known. We just would have assumed that whatever male was there at banding time and had been there earlier in the spring, and except for this one week time period, um, Maverick just kind of slipped in and slipped right back out. And he still has some, some kids out of that site. Uh, Copper, uh, this bottom left-hand site, she's another thorn in my side. Um, and this is an example of where peregrines and wolves are very similar in that we're having to manage them more and more intensively. Quite often, you generally are only going to have peregrines act aggressively or defensively when you're at the nest site. Um, you kind of expect it, so you put on hard hats. Sometimes you'll go farther than that with some of the birds. You may want to wear a face shield because they're so overtly aggressive and protective, um, depending on the site location. Copper was flying from the top of that paper mill stack quarter of a mile away and dive bombing people on a bridge that were using this bridge to cross from one side of the city to the other. And our concern was that on this bridge, it was a bridge going to a city park that the kids used to like to go to, but there was no division or barrier between the sidewalk and oncoming traffic. So she'd come out of nowhere, you're walking across the bridge, you get whacked in the head, you're, you see this thing screaming at you, you don't know what it is. If you have any common sense, you're gonna run or try and protect yourself. And our biggest concern was some kid was going to get struck or chased into oncoming traffic. And so we um, got permission from Fish and Wildlife Service to trap her and remove her. Um, the chicks were at an age old enough where um, we felt we could supplementally feed uh, dad and get those chicks to fledging age. I was within 10 miles of the site and alerted by Fish and Wildlife to turn around and come back to the Twin Cities because every news station was there uh, from the three-state area to watch the big bad biologist take mommy bird away from poor baby birds. And they really were not all that concerned about human safety. And so big lawsuit, a bunch of stuff went down the pipes. And basically what we did was um, 
we supplementally fed on a building adjacent, kind of brought her attention someplace else, and she did stop going after people on the bridges and acting assertively towards those people. And then in the fall, we pulled down the box. Um, again, I like peregrines, but not at the risk of someone getting hurt, um, which is our ultimate goal. And then the last uh, photo there is the, this year was the first year we had peregrines nesting back in Minnesota at the last site we had our last known nesting pair of peregrines in 1963. So that was a really exciting time. And again, it was a site discovered by falconers. Happened to be out looking at red tails and saw this pair of peregrines screaming along the cliff face. And it's a, not a very tall cliff, and we probably never would have found it if it hadn't been for them. So the, st the park staff was ecstatic to have peregrines back in the park where the last known nesting had been before recovery programs started. And basically to end it all, um, why do we do all this? Why do I put 20,000 miles of my car, drive up and down to Minnesota over a weekend, because I got nothing else to do? Um, it's, this project is so crucial and so important. We're, we're discovering more about peregrine falcons than was ever really known before we started this recovery program and we, we were um, having the population crash. We're finding out about population increases and decreases. The, still what's going on with contaminants. We're comparing the survivability of wild produce versus the captive release birds. Um, is there a difference? Um, some say yes, some say no, but if you look at the data over nearly 40 years, it's actually, they're quite comparable. Um, we did a really good job with some of those initial captive releases. Some of those birds have gone on to produce a lot of our wild stock that we have today. And it's even allowed us to consider a harvest and a take for the sport of falconry. Um, we're learning about clutch sizes, um, longevity, um, how long can peregrines reproduce um, and still be viable producers to, in the wild? How long do they live in the wild versus what do they live in captivity? Um, we know that an 18-year-old male peregrine can still produce young out in the wild, which was not even thought to exist when we started this project out. We're finding out that the site has more to do with the bird coming back and that birds are extremely aggressive and tenacious enough that they will kill another bird to gain territory for the tallest and the best site. And there are a bunch of birds just waiting for something to happen out there. If a bird gets hit, um, if a bird hits a building in downtown Minneapolis, we've had birds come into that site within a half an hour of finding out that adult female had died. And a seven-year-old bird we had not seen for seven years. All of a sudden he just showed up out of the blue, where has he been for seven years? We still have that to learn. And I think more than anything, it's exciting for what we've learned for peregrine falcons is helping other more critically endangered species, such as Mauritius kestrel, apple model falcons, and of a lot of other bird of prey species out there. And so we're able to take with what we learned with peregrine falcons and use it for other species. We did a really good job with peregrines. We still need to do a lot of work with other species out there. And it is the most widely renowned peregrine study in the world, um, which is something to be very excited about here in the Midwest. If you're interested in finding out about your Missouri birds, go to midwestperegrine.org. The entire database is on the website. You can type in AT&T building, find out all the birds that have ever been produced, where those young are, who the adults are, what's ever happened to them, if we know about it. You can find out about it at the website. I certainly can't do the job alone. No state coordinator can. I have a lot of people, probably 30 different people, that help with the bandings, the observations, the climbing. I am terrified of heights. I'm not hauling my butt off the side of some cliff over Lake Superior, but I've got really good people out there that will do it for me and make sure that those chicks get up to me at the top of the cliff so I can do my part of the job. Um, and it's such an exciting project to be a part of. I feel very fortunate, and it basically is due to these two guys. Pat Reddick and Bud Tordoff started the project here in the Midwest. Bud Tordoff is on the left, and he passed on the project to me in 2005. He definitely was one of those people that you have in your life as a mentor, but he was a tough old cuss. Into his 80s, 
You didn't screw around, and if you made a mistake, he called you on it. But I think that made me a better biologist and gave me a better understanding for how I can hopefully help peregrines into the next 30 years. So does anybody have any questions? Yes? Prairies. Um, and there was some fear at that time, though it was never proven, that they could create some genetic uh, problems in uh, wild populations. Is that, has that been the case that you know of, and is that practice still go on in uh, My understanding, I'm also a falconer, although I've never flown a, a peregrine or any type of falcon. My understanding for a lot of the imprints, it is most often that you want them to, any hybrid, to be an imprint. So that the goal would be that they are not going to, if they do take off on you, because that happens in the sport, that they are not going to become a genetic risk for the wild population. We have had some hybrids out there on territory. It's been more out in the western part of the U.S. Colorado has had a few cases. And what we've done is we have trapped those hybrids out of that territory. Um, we did have a falconry bird actually in downtown Minneapolis. She was lost in 1994 in Kansas. She ended up in downtown Minneapolis in 96 as a second year bird. Um, and she maintained that Minneapolis territory. She still had her breeder band and her bracelets on. The falconer did not want her back, um, which I was very happy about because I wanted her on territory uh, because we were at such early stages of the program. But to my knowledge, there has not been any pollution of the peregrine population. Um, and if anything, I would think it would be so minuscule, maybe one side out of 100, out of 200. And chances are, you know, there's going to be some other complications with that type of pairing. Is that practice still, um, I've kind of lost touch with the community, but is that something that's still, um, the captive breeding programs still produce mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that fly jeer peregrines, especially, for some reason. It's the size of the, the jeer and, you know, the temperament of jeers. They're pretty sweet birds, um, but they like the speed of the peregrine. Um, and I've, we have no case of that in the Midwest, of a hybrid on territory or impacting our Midwestern population. And just with the look of the bird. I mean, you know, over time I've gotten, you know, 20 years ago I probably couldn't tell you the difference between a pure peregrine and a peregrine prairie falcon, but I could now. With, with a fair amount of certainty. Yes? There is obviously some inbreeding, but again, if you look at some other species, for example, the Mexican wolf program, we started with seven animals, and we now have an entire recovery program based off of just seven different individuals. Peregrines, we started out with a lot more than that. Um, and with those different subspecies, we did have a fair amount of anatom or the continental subspecies, but we also used a lot of tundra birds. And we were really worried that because tundra subspecies tend to be more migratory, that a lot of these birds, even though they would be released in a habitat that should not cause them to migrate as far, what was really going to happen? And what we found is the genetics does not appear to have as much impact on their migratory behavior is what we were originally concerned about. A lot of the urban birds stay sedentary. Some do migrate, not all of them. We've had birds that do migrate and then all of a sudden click a switch, all of a sudden become sedentary and stay around year round in an urban area. Mm -hmm. We did, but again that's all we had. We are looking at less than 40 nesting pairs in the lower 48 and certainly none east of the Mississippi. And so with Tom Cade and them, it's like you kind of take what you have if you want peregrines at all. Yes? Um, what is the average age like? Um, usually by the time they're 8 to 10, we start to see them uh, go off the face of the earth. 
Um, but again, we have a lot of birds now that are in their mid-teens. We have a few birds, probably six, eight birds that are 16 to 18 in the Midwest, which is old for a wild bird. Um, our oldest known on record was a 20-year-old female, but that is ancient. The closest we've come to that since has been 18, 18 and a half. In captivity, they can live into their mid-20s. Have you come across a We have not as to date, but we still have a lot of work left to do and it all costs money, unfortunately. I mean, basically the Midwest Project, all the bands, it costs us about $8 to band every chick out there. We're banding about 450 chicks. The Raptor Center pays for all of those bands. So we're, the Raptor Center is a nonprofit agency trying to make do with their projects. So any opportunity we have from the state agencies, since many states do manage their own population, we do ask them for a donation. And for some states like Iowa, you know, you're looking at 20 some birds. That's, that's not a huge budget. For Minnesota, at over 100 chicks a year, you know, for our DNR up there, that's, that's a little bit more of a price take and every state agency is having more and more economic difficulties too. In the long run, we have been successful enough to write enough grants and find enough people with $5,000 here and there, $10 here and there to make it work. So we're good for at least another two seasons. I just put in my band order. <laughs> so I'll be banding through 2011. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, you mentioned their interactions with great horn owls. Uh, what are some of the other interactions and impacts that peregrines have with other raptors? The other biggest impact or um, interaction we see is with bald eagles along waterways. And a peregrine outside of the nesting season will kind of go his way, the bald eagle can do his thing. Once you have eggs, I have seen peregrine falcons put a 15 pound bald eagle into the river and nearly cause it to drown. They have um, such determination and it's not that bald eagles prey upon peregrine falcons or prey upon the young, but it's just, I don't want them in my territory. And it is amazing to see a two pound bird do that to a 15 pound bird where this, I've seen bald eagles head down a river near a nest site, go out of their way about a quarter of a mile and then come back to the river and continue because they've pr been dived at at some point or so it appears. Any other questions before I get to the live bird? Um, the live bird I brought with me today is a captive bred bird. She's um, captive bred for the sport of falconry in 2005 and I acquired her for the sheer purpose of education. To me, I don't think I can do my field work without giving people this unbelievable opportunity to see a live peregrine um, up close. They get to see the chicks. They very rarely get to see an adult bird. Um, she's sitting quietly up here mainly because she's got what we call a hood on her. And the hood acts kind of like a blinder, just like you would put on a horse. Keeps them calm. This is how she travels in the car. Um, she's not aware of anything coming up at her, but also she hasn't been used in a program for a while. Basically all I do right now is put the hood on to get her to step onto a scale and then I take the hood right back off. So she hasn't had the hood on for hours at a time like this in a while. She can be fairly vocal. Um, she can certainly out talk me. And I'm pretty much just going to stand up here with her because I don't want to mess up the carpet. Um, at the zoo. We'll take the hood off. Whoops, we'll get her back a little bit. Her name is Alita. She has a name not because she knows her name, um, but it's something humans like to do. She has what we often call hat head, her hood hair. Um, she will hopefully soon do what we also call is called a rouse. Um, she will shake all her feathers. It's kind of a comfort thing. It's also dinner time for her. 
And so she's kind of looking to see, okay, have I been good, have I been good, do I have a piece of quail? Have I been good, have I been good? Is there a piece of quail down at my feet? Kind of thing. So I may feed her depending on how she does. Again, she's just been kind of sitting in her um, enclosure, which falconers call muse for the last couple of months. It's kind of been her off season. She hasn't seen people for a while. She is completely wild. She is not tame. She is not domesticated. Um, that's why I have a dog at home. Um, she is 100% wild. And I don't expect anything more out of her than that. She is what she is. She's, she's in her own form. Um, but when you look at her, she's got great long talons for grabbing onto uh, prey that have feathers. She's built for speed, those long narrow wings. She also, at nighttime, she gets a little bit more antsy. Um, it's kind of bedtime for her, so she may be a little bit more nervous. She also doesn't know what this room is all about, so she's, she's probably going to do a little bit of looking around. And go potty is usually also what she does as soon as the hood comes off. So again, that's why I'm up here by the tarp. Her rotation is probably three quarters of the way, but again, with her having binary vision, she can still, you know, she doesn't have to have the same um, visual stuff as what like an owl would have with front facing eyes. Um, she has unbelievable eyesight. She's got special nares, those kind of look like white circles with a spot in the center that really helps with her aerodynamics and being able to deal with different pressure when she's diving at such speeds, um, when she's chasing her prey. Falconers today primarily use parrons because they like to hunt quarry. It's part of the tradition. Um, falconers are called falconers, but they don't all hunt with falcons. A lot of us hunt with what we call short wingers, which are red tails, Cooper's hawks, Harris hawks, things like that. Um, she is, she may cast up a pellet too, because this is usually when she will cough up a pellet and she'll do the same thing that you often hear owls do. Um, she was bred in captivity, like I had said before, uh, by somebody for the sport of falconry. She was flown for a single year by a falconer, but then developed frostbite on two of her digits. And he chose not to fly her a second season. And I got a phone call from this friend of mine that had produced her. He knew I was looking for a bird to use for education. And so I was able to get the appropriate federal and state permits to use her for education. So basically her job is a little bit different than your average falconry bird. I do not hunt with her. I have a different bird I hunt with. But she helps me go to schools, go to universities, talk about peregrines and recovery. And again, just give you that opportunity to see a peregrine up close. Yes? You know, people always say like, oh, a bald eagle, if you put a newspaper at one end of a football field, the bald eagle can read the small print from the other end of the football field. Who really knows? <laughs> you know, did the, pair, the bald eagle tell you that? And I've talked to enough vets that definitely their eyesight is better than ours. But to be able to say three times versus six times versus ten times, nobody can accurately give you that answer. Um, they definitely key in more on movement than anything. Um, I have sat with her outside, and I can't see anything up in the sky, but she'll start screaming, find out later it was an eagle. Um, eagles and peregrines also don't mix. Uh, golden eagles will kill peregrines out in the wild, prairie falcons, other birds like that. Yes? Pigeons are definitely number one, and depending on where, whether you're a city bird or a lakeshore bird, um, for us up on Lake Superior, we see a lot of ducks, a lot of um, herring gulls, things like that. Um, we did have some concerns in the first couple of years, making sure we did not put peregrine falcons back in certain areas in the western Great Lakes because of other bird species, such as piping plovers or other gull species that were more highly endangered. Um, we do have species um, that I've found saw wet owls in nest sites in, up on Lake Superior. 
Um, we find starlings, jays, um, an occasional crow, but they certainly at two pounds can kill something much larger than themselves. Again, falconers use them to hunt ducks, which are much larger, or pheasants, grouse, prairie chickens. It's a little warm and she's a little nervous. I don't know whether it's the lights or... Yeah, <laughs> that may be it too. I have seen her get nervous with photos in the living room um, that I have on the book or on the wall. Yes? Anywhere from 30 to 50 percent die their first year, um, depending again on the population, whether you're a city versus cliff versus bridge bird, um, kind of depending. Um, and generally speaking, depending on um, their hearing, they really don't use their hearing um, for hunting the way an owl would, per se. And so, um, you know, it probably is not the best, but again, does it really have to be? Again, she's just, she's definitely a little nervous, so I'm going to probably re-hood her. That's the other part with, shh, if you're quiet, it'll help. It is warm in here, and again, the lights or the video or something are making her nervous. So for me as a handler, it's also my job to make sure I don't put too much stress on her and make her too nervous. So I'm going to just put the hood back on her, and let her calm down a little bit. Um, again, she's a wild animal. This, this is not, you know, if you look at how many eyes are out there and as big as we are, and there's one of her. Um, strange location. We have good days, they have good days, bad days, just as well. Yes? Are peregrine falcons well suited for camouflage? Well, definitely the baby birds, with them being brown, definitely I think have a little bit of an advantage. Um, but also, it's more of an idea that the babies are built a little differently. They have longer wing feathers. Um, things are just a little bit bigger. So when they take that first flight, they have an easier time, learn how to fly with what equipment they have. And then when they become an adult, they've already basically been out there a year and learned how to survive, learned, learned a little bit about the hazards, and kind of been able to move on from there. But they really aren't like a camouflage kind of thing like maybe zebras or tigers or frogs or, or stuff like that. Any other questions? Yes? Um, recovery efforts um, basically throughout the world have done a lot of captive breeding, especially over in Europe. Um, and it's been very successful. There's um, I am not as familiar with Europe numbers as what I am with North America, but I know recovery has happened to the point where um, they're no longer in need of such protective measures or as concerned that the species is going to go extinct. But again, I think just the underlying effects of DDT and contaminants as well as habitat destruction is still a concern we're always looking at. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I want to thank everybody for coming out and um, listening. And I'll be up here for a little while, but again, because of the temperature and her nervousness, I am going to keep her hooded. But if you want to come up and take a look at her, that's fine. <laughs>